Hey folks, we're going to continue our look through Victorian poetry and, and poetry analysis with a famous, famous poem by a guy named Oscar Wilde called The Ballad of Reading Jail. Yes, I know G-A-O-L is not how we spell jail anymore, but it's an ancient spelling of jail uh, originating in England that's not even used in England anymore, but some of the really old, old jails um, that had always been spelled that way still had that spelling, and Reading Jail was one of them. So, um, Anyway, more on Oscar Wilde, more on Reading Jail in a minute. Just a, a quick review. Last class, we looked at um, stanza, different stanza lengths, couplets, quatrains, sestets, octaves. We looked at sound devices, um, alliteration, consonants, and assonance. We talked about some of those things. Uh, we mostly focused on that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we, we went and we read an illusion poem by Thomas Hardy called The Shadow on the Stone, also a Victorian poem. Um, Today we're going to look at a ballad. It's a really, really famous kind of poem that's written in something called the Common Meter, uh, and I'm going to go over that with you. Uh, you should be able to recognize a ballad whenever you see it. I would say that ballads and sonnets are the two most famous kinds of poems um, that you're going to run into a lot in classes from here until you know the end of college. Uh, so I want to make sure that you're you're aware of that. Uh, I'm just going to read this one to you. Uh, it's it's in five parts and it's relatively long. We're only going to look at the first two parts. That's it. Uh, if you want to read the rest because it's a fabulous poem and I highly recommend it, you go ahead and, and find it and read it. Um, the address is right up here, but I'll link it in today's material. So if you want to read the whole thing. But let me read you the first two parts um, just to give you a first look at them. And then we'll go back and we'll do the poetry work that we usually do. Um, we'll look at the author. Um, We'll look at um, some definitions. We'll, we'll identify um, the stanza length and the rhyme scheme and all of those kinds of things. And then we'll see what we can do about understanding what it means. Uh, but ballads are stories told in song, and this is a poem that's going to tell a story for us. So let me read it to you. The Ballad of Reading Jail. One. That's Roman numeral one. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain, within another ring, and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing, when a voice behind me whispered low, That fellow's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel, and though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step and why. He looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young, and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long. Some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day, who watch him when he tries to weep and when he tries to pray, who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. He does not wake at dawn to see dread figures throng his room, the shivering chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor all in shiny black with the yellow face of doom. He does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse more mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer blows. He does not know that sickening thirst that stands 
one's throat before sans sorry that sans one throat before the hangman with his gardener's glove slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs that the throat may thirst no more he does not bend his head to hear the burial office read nor while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed he does not stare upon the air though a little through a little roof of glass he does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of caiaphas six weeks the guardsman walked the yards in suit of shabby gray his cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay but i never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day i never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky and at every wandering cloud that trailed its raveled fleeces by he did not wring his hands as do those witless men who dare to try and rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair he only looked upon the sun and drank the morning air he did not wring his hands nor weep nor did he peek nor pine but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne with open mouth he drank the sun as though it had been wine and i and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring forgot if we ourselves had done a greater little thing and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing for strange it was to see him pass with step so light and gay and strange it was to see him look so wistfully at the day and strange it was to think that he had such a debt to pay for oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot, but grim to see is the gallows tree with its alder bitten root, and green or dry a man must die before it bears its fruit. The loftiest place is that seat of grace for which all worldlings try, but who would stand in hempen band upon a scaffold high, and through a murderer's collar take his last look at the sky? It is sweet to dance to violins with love and light when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes is delicate and rare, but it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. So with curious eyes and sick surmise we watched him day by day, and wondered if each one of us would end the self same way, for none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. At last the dead man walked no more amongst the trial men, and I knew that he was standing up in the black dock's dreadful pen, and that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. Like two doomed ships that pass in storm, we had crossed each other's way, but we made no sign, we said no word, we had no word to say, for we did not meet in the holy night, but in the shameful day. A prison wall was round us both, two outcast men we were, the world had thrust us from its heart and god from out his care and the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare all right we could keep going but we're not going to um that's a good place to stop so let's go back and look at some things we'll start with some of the stuff that we looked at last time like rhyme scheme and and things like that so um you know let's start with the rhyme scheme we can see this coat is going to be an a uh red doesn't rhyme with coat so it's b hands doesn't rhyme with red or coat so it's c um dead definitely rhymes with red so that goes back to b loved rhymes with nothing that came before so it's a brand new rhyme it's d and then bed goes with dead and red so it's b so we got a b c b d b so it looks like we got three b's and then the other three are, are separate and different uh, that means that we've got a six line stanza if it's a six line stanza it's a sestet um, so this is in sestets. You can see the next one's a six-line stanza, too. And we have three rhymes, F, 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 and three that don't particularly rhyme with anything. Um, this head goes back to the last stanza and has a little bit of an interlock with bed, dead, and red. Um, but that's not something that continues. So um, it's not, you know, just I, I think it's chance, sort of. Um, but you can go down, you can look at all of the stanzas, and you can see that the second uh fourth and sixth lines all rhyme uh i sky by ring thing swing real steel feel now the other ones don't right pain done and low don't rhyme or walls became in pain they don't rhyme um why i die right like it goes goes this way through the entire thing so there's definitely a repeating rhyme pattern 
uh, and it's written in sestets. Uh, we can also look at some sound devices. We looked at assonance, which is repetition of initial consonant sounds, first consonant sounds. We looked at consonants, which is the ending sounds, so sounds at the end of the words, consonant sound repetition. And then um, we looked at assonance, which is a repetition of vowel sounds. And I tried to do the first two stanzas here for you. I'm not obviously going to do the whole thing. Uh, but remember that consonance is in yellow, assonance is in blue, and sorry, assonance is in green and um, alliterations in blue. So he did not wear his scarlet coat. I forgot the T on coat here. So we got consonants here in our first line. Um, see these ending sounds that are all T's. Uh, and then in the next line for blood and wine are red. We got blood, wine, and, and red. All three of those end with a D sound. And blood and wine were on his hands. So this one's wine and were is an alliteration, and his and hands are also alliterating. Uh, his and hands all both end in S as well, so that's a, a consonance. When they found him with the dead, this one's a bit of a stretch to say these two Ds, except that it links with all the Ds in the previous lines. Uh, there's a lot of D consonants in here. I didn't find anything in this line. The poor dead woman whom he loved. I wanted to say maybe this was alliteration, woman and whom, but they're kind of different sounds. What and who, you know, like whom. Um, so I didn't, I didn't mark that as alliteration and murdered in her bed. So there's actually another D in here that you could sort of link if you wanted to in the consonants. Um, it, it creates this re repeating sound. Um, and then if you look at the next stanza, he walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby gray, a abby, a, it's the same a sound. So this is your only example of assonance in these first two stanzas. Um, a cricket cap, that's alliteration, was on his head, that's alliteration as well. And then I didn't find anything in the rest of this. Maybe I'll find it with a quick read here. And his step seemed light and gay. Yeah, I just found one step seemed. We got more alliteration here. Um, so I'll blue that. Uh, step seemed light and gay. I don't see anything there. Um, but I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. So I don't, I don't see anything else. That's all the stuff from last time. Uh, and, and hopefully you see that there. Uh, so let's do what we should do whenever we get a new poem. Uh, we want to look at the title first. Uh, I think you guys got a, maybe a little bit on the first read through there, like what literally is going on. Um, this is a poem about a guy in jail uh, who has been um, marked for death. He's on death row. Um, the narrator's not on death row. He's watching. He's also in jail. He's watching a guy on death row, uh, a guy who has to swing. That's, you know, back when they hung people by the neck until dead. This is a Victorian poem. That was the final punishment in Victorian times. And so he's, it's, it's a poem about a man who is going to die. It's not from the perspective of the man who's going to die. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll look at that more as we go through and read and try and understand each of the stanzas. Uh, but the ballad of reading jail, first off, you know, if you want to understand the title, you need to know what a ballad is. So let's, let's take a look. What's a ballad. I've got a new definition here for you, a new term, a ballad. Do, do, do. We'll just add it to the list here. Um, is a story told in song in quatrains or sestets. If it's in quatrains, then it's going to rhyme in an A, B, A, B, or A, B, C, B rhyme scheme. If it's in sestets, it's going to be A, B, A, B, A, B, or A, B, C, B, D, B. And that's what we've got, right? We just looked at that. Uh, A, B, C, B, D, B. Uh, so it's definitely got um, a ballad rhyme scheme. Uh, it's a story told in song, right? Like it's telling the story of this guy uh, in jail. And so, yeah, okay, it fits that. Um, and then the last part of a ballad is the lines alternate between eight and six syllables. I don't know how you guys are counting syllables, uh, but we can go do that real quick. Um, I'm going to use, you know, my hand and count them for you. He did not wear his scarlet cloak or coat. Sorry, that's, that's eight. For blood and wine are red. That's six. And blood and wine were on his hands. That's eight. When they found him with the dead. Six. The poor dead woman whom he loved. Eight. And murdered in her bed. Six. So it's alternating between eight and six. This is also something that's called the common meter. Uh, it's a very, very common meter in church hymns. Um, in poetry and in songs, and you can find it all over the place. It turns out that the easiest way to know 
that you're in the common meter is if you can sing it to the tune of Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He did not wear his scarlet cloak, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead. Right, like, so you could actually sing the whole thing if you wanted to, because it's got that alternating rhythm. That's what we call a meter. Um, so let me let me give it that, that tune one more time and read you the first couple of stanzas. He did not wear his scarlet cloak, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in the suit of shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. Right, like, so you can you can sing it. And it turns out that there's a lot of things that you can do this to. Um, let's look at some other poems. There's a thing called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Really famous. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By the long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? Right, so we could do that. Or you could look at another poem by a guy named Williams, William Wordsworth, really famous poet. Lines written in early spring. I heard a thousand blended notes while in a grove I sat reclined. In that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. Right, or you could go to America and do Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. Or, you know, you could go to modern songs. I gave you this as an example of a quatrain, but Piano Man by Billy Joel. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday, the regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and gin. And there's a bunch of these things out there. Um, I don't need to burden you with it, but very, very common stanza uh, format, a, um, a ballad. So you should be able to identify a ballad if you can sing it to that tune. It's a ballad, and, and you're going to run into them a lot. So um, it's also called common meter. Ballad stanza or common meter. So again, story told in song, in quatrains or sestets. Um, the lines alternate between six, sorry, eight and six syllables. First line's eight, second line's six. Um, and, and you can sing it to that tune. All right. So back to our title. We were looking at the title. It's called The Ballad of Reading Jail. Uh, jail, we all know, is, is a place where prisoners are put. Reading is a town in England. So, um, you know, is Reading Jail a real place? Well, let's find out, shall we? So yeah, Reading Jail is a real place. Uh, the prison Reading was built in 1844 as the Berkshire County Jail in the heart of Reading on the site of the former county prison alongside the site of the Reading Abbey and beside the River Kennet. So you could go find it on a map in England if you want to, but let's see some images in Victorian times, what this place looked like. Um, you know, this is Reading Jail, a Victorian prison house. Looks something like that. So there's some inmates for you. Uh, Anyway, uh, that gives you, I think, enough to go on. Let's get back to our story. So the next thing we want to look at, you know, after we've, we've discovered what the title means, so this is a story told in song about a prison called Reading Jail, is we take a look at the author himself, Oscar Wilde. So Oscar Wilde, if you go to Wikipedia, oh, we want to see his, his fashionable picture here. So let me move us over. I'll have to move us back here in a little bit, but whatever. Um, Oscar Wilde is a really famous guy. I'm going to summarize some of this for you. Um, he was uh, mostly known as a playwright. He wrote a lot of plays, especially comedies. His comedy, The Importance of Being Earnest, is still being put on today, as is another one called Lady Windermere's Fan. Uh, he also wrote a really famous novel called The Picture of Dorian Gray. Great book. Highly recommend it for anybody who's looking for a summer read. Um, it's about a it's about a young man who uh, has a portrait painted of him, and he makes a wish that the portrait would age and take on all of his sins, and that he will stay young and beautiful forever. And uh, the wish is magically granted, and lots of stuff happens. Again, I highly recommend the book. It's it's full of philosophy and very interesting. Um, but uh, most famously, I guess Oscar Wilde um, was an incredibly witty guy. Um, he always had a, a bright remark, a witty comeback, uh, and so he became very famous during his lifetime. Uh, and people followed him around and uh, wanted to hear what he had to say. He was sort of a an important pop culture figure. Um, but the problem was that Oscar Wilde was gay. 
uh, and being gay in Victorian times was actually a crime. Um, he he uh, ended up being put on trial for it and found guilty. And as a sentence, he was sent to reading jail to uh, do two years of hard labor uh, because apparently the cure to gayness is chaining guys up to other sweaty men. Um, no, I'm just, you know, this is Victorian times and, and, you know, times have changed, thankfully, thankfully. This sort of broke his spirit, actually, and Oscar Wilde ended up um, at the end of his imprisonment, um, sort of a broken man. He, he ended up, uh, he died in Paris in, in a hotel. Uh, he's one of these people that, that, I love Oscar Wilde, by the way, he's, he's a literary genius and all of his stuff is great, as you can tell from this poem. Um, but his his wit was the famous thing about him, and he's a person who has what's called famous last words. Um, it turns out that he was in this hotel in Paris dying um, of an illness, and he hated the wallpaper in his hotel room, and he complained about it all the time. And he saved up his last little bit of energy. And uh, so apparently, and this is, this is hilarious, he, he was dying, and the last thing he said, the last words he said on earth were, Either that wallpaper goes, or I do. And, and then he died, uh, <laughs> which is amazing. I, I wish I had the, the wit and the, you know, power to, to say some last words like that. Anyway, but that's, that's Oscar Wilde. So if we go back to the Ballad of Reading Jail, um, we have to move our thing back over. Uh, Oscar Wilde went to this jail. And he lived there for two years doing hard labor. And this poem is told from the perspective of Oscar Wilde himself. And he is observing a man who is not sentenced to hard labor, but who is sentenced to death. And that gives you uh, a little bit more insight into the poem itself and what's going on. So let's um, read it here. And we're going to try and understand it from beginning to end, at least of the two parts that we read. And if you want to read more, you'll be able to go and do that. So um, The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. Now that we know that background, now that we know the context, I think you've got a better sense of what's going on. Uh, so one, he did not wear his scarlet coat for blood and wine are red and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. So this is the man who's going to die. We find this out a couple stanzas later, but he didn't wear his scarlet coat. That means that the, the man in question, the man who is the murderer was a soldier, right? Because the the British wore red coats. That's why we called them the red coats, the military. So he was a military man. Um, and when he went to trial, he didn't wear his, his military uniform uh, because blood and wine are red and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead. So he has blood on his hands uh, and he did it when he was drunk. So we're getting some good information here. But if you're, you know, I don't know, uh, interested in these kinds of things, as I am, Blood and wine are an interesting choice, especially for a Catholic, and Oscar Wilde is a Catholic, um, because there's this thing called communion in the church um, where you drink wine, but the wine is the transformed blood of Christ. And maybe there's something going on there that's an allusion to the Bible and to church and to communion. I don't know. It's too early in the poem to know what's going on 100%, but it's something that you should probably put in your head and think about. Um so blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead. The poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. So this guy's a murderer. He's got blood on his hands. And not only is he a murderer, but he killed his, I don't know if it's his wife or his girlfriend, but the woman he was in love with, he killed and he killed her in her bed. So uh, that's, that's pretty intense while he was drunk. Uh, so we're focusing on this murderer and that's going to be the subject of the poem from here on out he walked amongst the trial men so this is him when he was on trial in a suit of shabby gray um it's interesting that he's in a suit of gray gray as a color is um black and white tend to be right and wrong uh, and here's this guy sitting in a gray suit so maybe there's something um symbolic there as well uh a cricket cap was on his head so we're getting an image. What's a cricket cap look like? I think it's a baseball cap, but, you know, let's let's double check that. Yeah, here's a cricket cap. It's a baseball cap, basically. Um, and so I think this is going to tell us a little bit about the guy's class. 
Um, you know, he's not a rich guy who's wearing a top hat or something like that. He has a suit on for the sake of the trial. Uh, but there's this this hat that he's wearing that shows sort of that he's not of the higher class. So even though he's a red coat, he's probably a, a regular soldier, a private, or or something like that. Uh, also, the suit is shabby. It's not it's not a fancy suit. It's like a you know lent lent to him kind of a suit. And his step seemed oh, sorry. And his step seemed light and gay. There's a contrast. Gay is happy. It's an old word for happy. Uh, so he doesn't seem particularly upset about the crime that he has committed. Uh, however, we have a, a sort of a paradoxical contrast, but I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I'm not sure that a lot of you know what the word wistfully means, so we're going to look that word up as well. I always recommend looking up a word that um, you don't know so that you know what the poet's trying to say. So wistfully is with a feeling of vague or regretful longing. So it's it's like a longing you don't completely understand and it's full of regret. So he's looking outside at the daylight wistfully. He's longing to be free. Uh, he's regretting what he has done that's put him in this position. Uh, and that phrase, so wistfully at the day, I feel like it comes back again and again. So it's definitely a word we want to know. He says, I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye. Now that's a personification, right? Like an eye itself doesn't have emotions like wistfulness. Uh, but there we go. Upon that little tent of blue, which prisoners call the sky. This is a metaphor. The sky is not a tent of blue, but a tent is up over your head and, and uh, you know, like a circle tent or something like that and the tent in this case is the sky the prisoners are trapped inside the walls of the prison and they can never leave but you can look up and you can see the freedom you can see the sky probably birds flying through it mocking you in their own sort of free way um so same thing with the clouds and every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by that's a metaphor too um clouds don't have sails they're not sailing ships but he's metaphorically saying these it's a sort of a poetic way of talking about it these clouds are sailing the sky so we've got this guy who committed a murder um we we see him on his trial day and we see him um affecting a light and gay step he's, he's putting out a persona that he doesn't seem to care about what he has done or what's going on but if you look in his eyes and you follow his gaze and you see the expression on his face, he can't contain the wistfulness, the regret, the sorrow, the sadness, the desire to be free, all of those kinds of things. Uh, anyway, he keeps going. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing. When a voice behind me whispered low, that fellow's got to swing. Right. So um, Oscar Wilde is in a group of prisoners who are not um who have not committed dangerous crimes right like these guys are he's he's you know in prison for being gay he's not going to be hung or or anything like that and so he's with these lower i guess crime rate criminals uh and it's another ring and that's probably a, a reference to dante's inferno and the rings of hell and how prison is like a hell but he's in a, a lighter ring of hell if you will and this guy's in the ring where the murderers are um and he was wondering if this guy he for whatever reason he got you know caught up looking at this guy and thinking about whether he had done a greater little thing and this is when he finds out that the guy's gonna die swing is an old metaphor for hanging by the neck until you're dead because you're swinging by the rope and so it's sort of a vulgar way of talking about that um so this is when oscar wilde himself finds out that this guy that he's been looking at who has the wistful eye is going to die uh, dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel. This is a powerful line. A cask is a, um, well, it's like a casket, but it's also something you can put wine in. Um, but the idea of scorching steel is sort of a hell image, I think, as well. So um, he gets faint. He hears that this guy's going to die, and Oscar Wilde sort of faint. Um, and though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. And I feel like this; these lines all connect the prison to hell. Um, this idea that it's it's scorching, um, that he's in pain. They're all here in pain, but people are in different amounts of pain. Anyway, I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step and why. He looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. So Oscar Wilde, who himself is probably looking wistfully at the sky and thinking about wanting to be out of prison, um, realizes that eventually, after a sentence of two years, he's going to be free from prison. But this guy 
is not. The murderer is going to die. And so this is the place he's going to spend the last few days of his life. Right? Um, garish day. Uh, you probably want to know what garish means. Again, we just keep looking up these words because why not? Uh, so let's throw garish in here. I'm just trying to model good behaviors for you for when you read. Um, obtrusively bright and showy. Synonyms, gaudy, lurid, over bright, uh, right? So it's a really bright, sunny day. And that brightness of the day contrasts with the darkness of the deed and the emotions that these people feel. Um, the man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. So this guy has killed, remember, his, his girlfriend or his wife, the love of his life. And he's going to die from that. And then Oscar Wilde drops the bomb on us. So, so far, we're just hearing the story of a man. But then he says, yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each, let this be heard. So he's talking to his readers. He's talking to you out there reading his poem. He says, you know what? This guy has done what we all do. We all kill the thing we love. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. That's a reference to Judas and how he kissed Jesus to identify him in the Bible. And that's how he got captured and, and crucified. So that's clearly an illusion if you're looking for an illusion. The brave man with a sword. So it's almost like he's praising the murderer because he had the guts to kill his love openly and publicly and take the punishment for it. A lot of people don't do it that way. They, they're they in love and they get married, but they slowly murder the love, maybe not the person, but the love with bitter looks, with flattering words. Um, and some kill their love when they are young and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. So some people cheat and thereby kill their love. Some people are greedy and focus entirely on money and, and wealth and stop paying any attention to their love and it dies, it starves. Um, the kindest use a knife because the dead so soon grow cold. Now, I don't know that I can agree with Oscar Wilde here that it's kinder to murder somebody than it is to, to slowly let the love die through neglect or abuse or, or whatever, but He's making a strong point that we're all guilty on some level of um, you can't sustain that level of emotion, that level of connection eternally. And, and there's going to be ebbs and flows and, and things like that. Uh, some love too little, some too long. Some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. And so this is the contrast here that, that Wilde's trying to draw. Like, if we're all guilty of this on some level, if, if we all kill our loves, why do we not get punished and this guy does? This guy's going to die for it because he did it literally rather than figuratively. Um, so we're talking about each man here. He does not die a death of shame on some day of dark disgrace, which is going to happen to the man who's going to be hanged, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face. Normally what they did was they put a bag over their head and then the cloth around their neck and hung them, or the, the rope around their neck and hung them, um, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. And that's how the, the gallows works, right? You're standing on the floor and it's a trap door and it opens and boom, you fall down. Uh, it's pretty intense imagery here. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day. This is what it's like to be in prison, I think. Uh, who watch him when he tries to weep. That's my dog moving the hole. Yeah, anyway. Um, and when he tries to pray. I think it's interesting that he says tries to weep and tries to pray as if these things are difficult for somebody uh, who's on death row. Who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. And so he's, this this prisoner, this murderer, is being watched all day and all night by silent men, right? They watch him when he tries to cry. They watch him when he tries to pray. And they watch him in case he's going to commit suicide because they don't want him to commit suicide because he's got to be hung. And there's sort of a paradox in that too. He, he's not allowed to take his own life, but his life is forfeit. Um, let's keep going. He does not wake at dawn to see, 
dread fingers, figures throng his room, the shivering cap, chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor all in shiny black with the yellow face of doom. So, you know, people who, who kill their love in a more traditional way with lust or with greed or with hateful words or, you know, with apathy or, or whatever, they don't face the consequences of the man who murdered his wife. He's in his room. He's going to meet with the chaplain. Chaplain's come to give him his last rites. Maybe, you know, ask him for a confession. Um, the sheriff, who is stern with gloom, staring there waiting for this, this hanging to happen. The governor, um, you know, who has come to see the prisoner because he's a high profile prisoner. Um, he does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse-mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer blows. This is a good simile for you. Um, when your time is marked, when you've only got a little bit of time left in the world because you're going to your death, every second matters. It's like a hammer blow. Thum, thum, thum. Really good, um, strong imagery there. Also, this idea that, you know, like all of these people in the world who have killed their love, metaphorically speaking, they don't have to wear convict clothes. There's nothing singling them out. There's nothing showing them for the murderers of love who they are. You know, they just get to live their regular lives. Um, difference between doing something literally and doing something figuratively, I guess. He does not know that sickening thirst that sands one's throat before the hangman with his gardener's gloves slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs that the throat may thirst no more. I think that one's pretty straightforward. I don't need to go over that. He does not bend his head to hear the burial office read, nor while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead, cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed. Um, so... There's there's a shed, like a small building that's near the gallows. The gallows is the scaffold upon which is the, the hangman's noose. And the shed is where you keep the prisoner until the crowd is gathered and everything, you know, happens. So we have an image here of the prisoner being taken to this shed where he's going to have to wait until he comes out to the gallows themselves. Uh, but the thing that's terrible about this is he has to cross his own coffin. His coffin's waiting there and he has to walk by it and he knows that he's going to be put in there after he's dead. That's a, that's a terrifying image. Um, he does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass. That's the window in the shed, the prisoner sitting in the shed, waiting for his execution, looking out the window, you know, like all of the people who murder their love in a more traditional way don't have to go through any of these experiences. He does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass, nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of Caiaphas. Now, the kiss of Caiaphas is clearly an illusion. Let's look that up and see what it means. Wilde mentions the kiss of Caiaphas, and we've got to look up this guy Caiaphas or else you don't know what the illusion is too. It turns out that Caiaphas is the uh, Jewish high priest who, according to the Gospels, organized a plot to kill Jesus. He famously presided over the trial of Jesus. Uh, so what's interesting is this is a guy who um, is sort of a hypocrite, and his his kiss of Jesus is, um, you know, like he's he's to maintain his own power murdering his savior, you know, like from the, from the perspective of, um, Christians. And so when we get to, um, our story here, he does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass. He does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass, nor feel upon his shuddering cheek, the kiss of Caiaphas. And the idea is that the person who is going to hang and judge all of the people, in fact, who are, are part of the process of this guy's um, sentencing and execution have, have killed the thing they love in the same way that this man has, except that this one's literal and theirs is metaphorical, and they all pass judgment on him. And that's sort of like Caiaphas, I guess. So you want to you wanna look up any illusions, any words that you don't know. So we're on to part two, last part, and I'll try and make this quick because we're, we're running a little long on our um, analysis here. Um, part two. Six weeks the guardman walked the yard, this is the, the man who committed the murder, in a suit of shabby gray. His cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. So this is sort of a montage. Six weeks between the trial and the execution. So this man has six weeks to live and Wilde watches him every day when they're out 
you know, exercising in the yard together. And they're each in their own separate circle um, of different types of prisoners. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue, which prisoners call the sky. It's a repetition. It's sort of a chorus. And at every wandering cloud that trailed, it's raveled fleeces by. Um, fleeces, of course, are, are sheep. So we're looking at clouds that look like wool from a sheep blowing across the sky. He did not wring his hands as do those witless men who dare to try and rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair. So this man has no hope. Um, he's not trying to rear. He's not trying to grow hope in a cave of black despair. It's impossible. There's, there are prisoners, apparently, who do this, but this is not one of them. He only looked upon the sun and drank the morning air. He did not wring his hands nor weep, nor did he peek nor pine. Pine is to long for or wish for or cry over. Um, but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne. You probably want to know what anodyne means, um, but it's a solution to pain. So it would be like, um, you know, a, a medicine that, that cures your pain. Um, but, you know, I, to show you good behaviors, we'll look it up. Um, let's see, a pain-killing drug or medicine. Yep, right there as a noun. So, um... He looks, he drank the air as though it was a medicine, is essentially a pain-killing medicine. With open mouth, he drank the sun as though it had been wine. And this, these are both similes. Um, the sun is not wine, you know, like, but he's appreciating the days because he has so few of them left to him, I think is the idea here. And I and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring forgot if we ourselves had done a great or little thing and watched with gaze of dull amaze. That's what we call an oxymoron. Amazement is the opposite of dullness. Uh, and he says that they're gazing with dull amaze. Um, and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing. For strange it was to see him pass with steps so light and gay. And strange it was to see him look so wistfully at the day and strange it was to think that he had such a debt to pay uh and now we get this little bit on trees which i think is is very powerful and disturbing for oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot but grim to see is the gallows tree now obviously the the hangman's noose the gallows is not a tree uh, but grim to see that's a metaphor the gallows tree with its alder bitten root and green or dry, a man must die before it bears its fruits. The idea of the fruit of the gallows tree. You know how like an apple would hang from a branch of a tree. It's a man who's hanging from the gallows. That's, that's a disturbing image. The loftiest place is that seat of grace. Loftiest means highest. Um, so the highest place in the prison is for, for a prisoner is, is the gallows platform. Um, for which all worldlings try, but who would stand in a hempen band upon a scaffold high? That's a, a rhetorical question. And through a murderer's collar, take his last look at the sky. That's a powerful rhetorical question, putting you, the reader, in the position of this man um, seeing out of his eyes. It is sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, <coughs> I'm sorry, to dance to lutes is delicate and rare. But it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. And so this is sort of a, the vulgarities that prisoners use to refer to things like hanging. We, we said that man's got a swing. Another one is to dance upon the air. And so here's, you know, like the image of his feet, like dancing as he's dangling. It's pretty, it's pretty dark stuff. Uh, so with curious eyes and sick surmise, we watched him day by day and wondered if each one of us would end the self same way for none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. Um, there's that color red coming back, which showed up at the beginning, which I think is worth looking at. At last, the dead men walked no more amongst the trial men, and I knew that he was standing up in the black docks dreadful pen. That's the solitary confinement before the execution. So, Oscar Wilde goes out one day um, and takes his exercise and he looks for this guy and the guy's not there. So he knows the guy's been moved to solitary in preparation for um, the inevitable. Um, and I saw, I knew that he was standing in the black dock's dreadful pen and that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. And here's a simile about Oscar Wilde and this man, like two doomed ships that pass in storm, we had crossed each other's way. 
but we it's interesting he picks a storm here too i think it's symbolic for the difficulties of their life at this particular moment they're both in in a storm um but we made no sign we said no word we had no word to say for we did not meet in the holy night but in the shameful day a prison wall was round us both two outcast men we were the world had thrust us from its heart and god from out his care and the iron gin gin in this case i think it, we're not talking about gin as like a um drink we're talking about gin as a machine um, and we need to look that one up too. So we got to find the correct um, definition. Jin, huh? Yeah, good. Let's let's look at images of that. Uh, let's go with definition because gin as a as an alcoholic beverage makes no sense. A clear alcoholic spirit, nope. A two-handed game of rummy, nope. So we we got to get two more definitions and word origin. Um, let's see, a machine for separating cotton from its seeds, a receipt, a machine for raising and moving heavy weights, um, a snare for catching game. All right. So let's look and see which one of those applies here, uh, because this is a tricky word. I think, um, a prison wall was round us both to outcast men. We were, the world had thrust us from its heart and God from out his care and the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare. So we're not dealing with a machine here. We're dealing with a trap. They both been trapped by sin, his great Oscar Wilde small by comparison, and they're both being punished, um, you know, in this, in this way. So, We'll stop there. If you want to read the rest of the poem, it's out there. Uh, but we're we're at about forty five minutes, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end this video. Um, it's a ballad. You want to remember that. You want to look at the stanza length and be able to you know see what's going on. But this is also a powerful poem because it's about um, you know a, a side of of life that doesn't usually get written about. Poets don't usually go to jail, and so they're not able to write uh, with an insider's perspective about uh, something like the inside of reading jail and Oscar Wilde takes the opportunity, um, you know, because he's forced into it to write this poem, which is a powerful poem, I think, um, and tries to expose some truths about life. Uh, and at the same time to give us, um, compassion for criminals and for the murderer. Um, and you know, I don't know if, if you think he was successful or not, but I, I think it's worth your time to, um, you know, reread the poem and think about it. So, uh, all right.